Okay, so uh, welcome to our uh, final session of day two of our Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, Summer School. Uh, this afternoon I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Professor Daryl Sturt from uh, Lingnan University in, in Hong Kong. Uh, Daryl is someone we seem to know pretty well for a, a, a number of uh, reasons. Well, firstly, he was here uh, last year. Uh, I'm trying to think, was it something like February last year? Uh, late February, March. Late February. Um, when he, um, he did one talk and he also showed us uh, one of the films that he's going to be uh, discussing there, uh, Hanging Their Kid, which is a wonderful um, uh, indigenous children's film that uh, we really um, uh, enjoyed. Um, and he, he also talked about his work as a translator, because one of his, his um, apart from being a, uh, uh, a, a translation academic, he, he's also a professional uh, translator. And, and, uh, last year he talked about his translation work on uh, Horace Herz, uh, let me see if I can remember the name of the book, uh, Tree Fort on Carnation Lane, a wonderful um, uh, novel. Uh, um, another reason why we, uh, we're very familiar with, uh, with Daryl and Daryl's work was because um, we're both fans of Shi Chongyu, the, uh, the Taiwanese uh, writer. Uh, but um, uh, Daryl goes further than, than I do. I just read. Uh, uh, I just uh, I love reading Shu Yu's uh, work. But Daryl's translated um, uh, some of her work, and particularly uh, the um, the book um, Wedding in Autumn and other stories that we we launched um, earlier this uh, this year. I think in uh, in in May. Um, uh, Daryl originally was at National Taiwan University. Um, uh, but he's made the, uh, the, uh, the uh, he's migrated over to uh, to Hong Kong, and we've discovered that there's pros and cons uh, to this. Um, um, but I'm pretty sure, like many of us, uh, his heart is still in in, in, uh, uh, in in Taiwan, and we're going to get much more of Daryl. Uh, so he's, this is his first talk, but he'll also be doing another talk on on uh, translation, and he'll be introducing a film on the final day. Uh, about so school, so lots to uh, look forward to. So let's give Daryl a very big uh, so us welcome home. Um, so our our speakers using the, the microphone. Yeah, have to lean, lean forward. Um, okay, um, thanks everyone. I'm talking to you today about uh, indigenous film from Taiwan. Okay, and yeah, we don't. So. <laughs> and we can segue from um, Aoi Mona's uh, wonderful presentation just now on, on um, uh, legal rights of indigenous people, uh, indigenous subjectivity uh, according to the law, to my presentation um, with a consideration of definition of indigenous film. I think basically it has to be about indigenous people, so the characters in the film have to be indigenous. But there are about three dozen films that were made with actors who are Chinese, Chinese actors playing indigenous people, made by indigenous directors. The uh, screenwriters were uh, Chinese as well. Director was Chinese, screenwriter was Chinese. All the actors uh, were Chinese, and I'm pretty sure they did not get the permission of the, <laughs> of the village that the movie was supposed to be uh, about. Um, today there are still Chinese directors making films about indigenous people, but they will tend to get the permission of the communities, they will use indigenous actors, and when indigenous people are making films about indigenous people, they will involve the community, they'll involve amateur actors uh, from the community. And I think this is an ideal of indigenous filmmaking, as in the Canadian film The Fast Runner at Narja, it was pretty famous for establishing this model of community-made uh, feature film. So, um, the, um, the term in, in terms of which I'll discuss uh, Taiwan film from, uh, indigenous film from Taiwan is domestication.al say something about that in a second. Teach your children well. I know that Adam has uh, recognized this uh, allusion to a song that uh, my father used to play when I was a little bitty baby in the 1970s on the record player by Crosby, Stills and Nash. Had, had anyone else recognized this song? Crosby, Sills, and Nash. And I, I really liked this song when I was a little bitty baby, or I was about five years old, I think. 
And um, I put the parts that I particularly liked in, in italics. You who are on the road must have a code, like a moral code like Gaia, to live by. But you're not staying in your traditional community. You're now going out into the world. And you need a code that can adapt to the very situations you might find yourself out on the road. And uh, also the idea that in the last uh, line, or second last line, that you help them with your youth, that uh, uh, parents can learn from children too. Maybe that's a pretty atraditional uh, notion, but the main reason I chose this is the title is we're talking about traditional education passed down from parents to children and not formal education where you learn whatever the Ministry of Education thinks that you should learn. So that's, that's an explanation of the title. Okay. But a lot of, a lot of the uh, lyrics are incomprehensible. <laughs> Did not uh, strike me so much at the time. This is the background um, image for all of the slides. This is Teach Your Grandchildren Well. Uh, Aoi Mona will recognize Teminawi and her granddaughter by uh, adoption. And Teminawi is someone in, from Alan Gluban, from Tingyo Bulo in central Taiwan, um, who's devoted the past 30 years of her life trying to record uh, indigenous uh, traditional culture and pass it on to uh, her grandchildren's generation. So that's the background image. So this is my abstract. Now, indigenous directors in Taiwan have been making indigenous films for a century. Since uh, 1920, the first films were in the Japanese era. Only since 2006 have indigenous directors been able to make indigenous films, first for the TV screen, then for the silver screen, then for films released in the movie theater. How are indigenous made films different? I'm going to answer this question by focusing on the films of three indigenous directors in a framework of domestication. So what's domestication? If you look uh, on the online ecological dictionary, which I spend a lot of time on as a translator to understand the history of words that I'm using in my translations, domestication is ambivalent. Ambivalent means it has two uh, or an ambiguous uh, valent is related to valence, it's related to value, semantic value, it just basically means it has two different meanings. Um, domestication is uh, cognate with dom domicile, the place where you live, where you make yourself at home, uh, but it's also of course related to taming of animals, domestic animals, settlement of people, and especially indigenous people, and also exploitation. It can be a symbol for exploitation of, uh, of human beings, even in enslavement. So both semantic valences, domestication, play out in indigenous films in Taiwan. You'll see I say versus discipline, domestication versus discipline. Well, it turns out that discipline is also ambivalent depending on who is, is disciplining who. I think self-discipline is a good thing. If you're disciplining yourself, it's, it's a good thing, it's a virtue, and I'm a parent now, so one has to discipline one's children to a certain extent. It doesn't mean we're, we're hitting her all the time, but there have to be rules. And have to, have to, she has to understand that, and eventually she has to discipline herself. But uh, for academics, we, we can't control uh, how people feel about the words we use as academics, and uh, discipline for academics has been redefined by Michel Foucault uh, 50 years ago. Why am I mentioning Foucault? Everyone's heard of uh, Foucault's definition of discipline because, in part, my presentation is a response to Paul Barclay's wonderful new book, Outcast Empire, released about four or five months ago by University of uh, California Press. I don't know if Paul is a Foucauldian, but um, the scholars that he is responding to in his book use Foucauldian uh, concepts in their research. So if you're researching colonial history in Taiwan, you tend to use, it seems, Foucauldian uh, concepts. So this is from uh, Barclay's work. After 1910, the uh, state proceeded to inventory, catalog, regulate, regiment, spatially array, and even nurture indigenous populations. And I, Paul's got a sense of humor, and that's why I put, and even nurture, as if this is somehow surprising that the state would, would, trying to be, would be trying to help indigenous people, but I guess they did that once in a while. Indigenous populations in Taiwan uh, to extract wealth from the islands. While this panoptical activity rep, uh, resembled discipline, and the panopticon, does everyone know about the panopticon? This is now 50 years old in, in, in scholarship. Basically, it's an idea from, from Jeremy Bentham for a prison where um, you're in this prison, and um, there's a camera 
like a CCTV camera, and so somebody might be watching you. But um, you're never sure, are they watching you right now or not? Are they watching you right now or not? Because I guess they, they, don't, they don't have unlimited resources. They can't have somebody watching this camera 24-7. So you know, you're never sure if somebody's watching you. That's the panopticon. For um, Foucault, this becomes a metaphor for uh, subjectivity, where it's not just other people are watching me. I see you're watching me. It's paying attention to me. Thank you very much. But uh, um, instead of uh, like police officers or um, other representatives of the state watching you, you start to watch yourself. It becomes internalized. That's Foucauldian discipline. You start to regulate yourself. Uh, and Foucault contrasts this with punishment, where punishment is, I, I will obey the rules because I'm afraid of punishment. I don't feel bad about it. I don't, uh, um, I, haven't, I, I haven't internalized this, uh, this mechanism of, of control. Discipline is different. It's been internalized. It's this in, inner eye inside your mind that's watching everything you do, so you, so you behave yourself. Um, so while this panoptical activity by the Japanese colonial state resembled discipline, it excluded the most important element of discipline, which is the state did not produce individuals in Taiwan. For Foucault, discipline produces modern individuals who self-regulate, so I guess the, the police don't have to, to punish them. It makes uh, uh, populations easier to govern. So the state did not produce individuals by discipline in Taiwan's indigenous territories. Rather, it produced tribes settlements, ethnic groups, and aborigines. It also produced tourism. Ethnic tourism in, in Taiwan is almost 100 years old. By 1925, Jiaban San, a former hot spot in the camps for wars, late 19th century, early 20th century, had become a show village for indigenous culture, despite its minority indigenous population. So even though there weren't many indigenous people living there, it became kind of a model village where you could go and see and supposedly indigenous people um, performing a traditional indigenous lifestyle for um, tourists who were, I guess, nostalgic uh, or tired of, of life in the big city. Uh, Jiaoban San made a transition from battleground to ethnic theme park. Fast forward 50 years, this is um, Barclay still, the revival of a tile weaving practices partly based on uh, textiles collected during colonial times and preserved in Japan now illustrates uh, claims of a tile distinctiveness and autochthony. The map used to make this argument for a tile sovereignty is not the home of a particular dialect, community, ritual group, or voting district, but rather is the one uh, drawn up by Japanese ethnologists. So when in the 1990s, indigenous people started to define who they are and where they live, they uh, relied partly on research done by uh, Japanese uh, scholars. So, and this is where uh, Barclay leaves us at the end of his book. So I'm wondering what happened to the, the people in the post-war period, because he says that they were not disciplined. The state did not turn them into modern citizens, modern individual citizens in the colonial period. Uh, what happened to them after the, um, after the war, after Japan lost the war? Well, it seems to me that after the war, indigenous people were, to some extent, uh, incorporated into the body politic individually. They were disciplined, basically, according to Foucault's definition. Though they often left their ancestral homes in groups en route to work at a construction site or a fishing or on a fishing boat, they often went alone, as in the following song. And uh, I've got a handout. <laughs> the, uh, the song is translated on page one on the left-hand side, and uh, it goes, uh, my mom and dad, they told me, son go wandering, I left them crying and wandering, and crying went my way. So he's leaving the traditional village, he's leaving his age set if he's a mis, he's leaving his clan if he's a sa'idic or a tile. He's going off alone into the big city, into the big bad world. Where would I go wandering? I wandered to Taipei. I can't find her. He goes to find his girlfriend, but he can't find her. Uh, who knows where she is? She's probably uh, um, doing something. Uh, uh, um, she, she's probably up to no good, or uh, she's probably not being treated well. She's probably not being treated well. All I do is sing the blues. I cannot find the girl that I love. So. In the post-war period, people were disciplined, and traditional uh, uh, indigenous communities fragmented. 
From the 1970s, indigenous people were detached from their village communities, age sets, clans, families. They went to the city to sell their labor, to prostitute themselves, so to speak, but often literally working in an economy that was still mainly petty capitalist. And petty capitalism is from Hill Gates. Are there any fans of Hill Gates's scholarship in the audience? Petty capitalism is family-based capitalism. So in capitalism, usually it's individual. The individual is selling his labor on, or her labor on the open market. But in, in, in petty capitalism, it's family-based capitalism. The problem is they didn't treat their indigenous employees like family. They weren't members of the family, so they tended to get exploited in, in the capitalist fashion. The problem was that indigenous people were not part of the family. In the 1990s, as a result of the return our land, in the late 1980s, so indigenous people are demanding that the government gives back uh, their uh, ancestral land or give them back certain rights over the use of this ancestral land. Um, that's the return of our land movement in the 19, late 1990s. There was also a uh, return to the village movement led by indigenous writers uh, like uh, Aweni uh, and uh, um, who's the one from uh, Orchid Island? Um, Xiamen Lan Buan. There's some famous writers that return to uh, their villages after spending a uh, time in the big city. Why did these writers return to the village? To reconnect with traditional culture and rebuild traditional villages. Yet many either others return to the uh, uh, traditional village uh, as the gastarbeiter, the guest worker policy in, in Taiwan in the 1990s. Taiwan basically allowed in a lot of uh, workers from uh, the Philippines and, and Vietnam on short-term contracts on the model of uh, uh, Germany, which did the same thing to Greek and uh, Turkish workers after the war, but um, uh, they let these workers come in and work for lower than, than a minimum wage and made it impossible for them to ever become citizens. And uh, Taiwan and, and Germany are still de dealing with the, the effects of this very unfair policy, and the policy was also unfair to indigenous people because it made it harder for them to compete uh, for decent jobs. What did indigenous people do after they returned to the, uh, the village? They often tried to make a living by marketing aspects of traditional culture or hosting tourists nostalgic for a pre-modern lifestyle. At least in that respect, little seems to have changed since Jiaoban Shan, the ethnic village in the 1920s. This trajectory of leaving the village, failing, and then coming back to the village can be traced in a trilogy of films starring Sun Yu. Who has heard of Sun Yu, the late recently a uh, deceased actor, uh, Sun Yu. Any Sun Yu fans? <laughs> the audience? Okay. Um, the best dramatic feature um, uh, at the 1984 Gold Most Awards, the second spring of, uh, of Mr. Mo, Lao Mo, Old Mo, Lao Mo, the dear of Chun Tian, it's now unwatchable. I don't know how they gave the, the award <laughs> for the... The best feature, it's offensive, I'll tell you why in a second, is the last film where indigenous people represented by Old Man Mo's Taiwanese wife. He's 50 years old, he wants a son, so he wants to get married. Who's going to marry a guy like that? He's poor, he's got nothing. And so he goes and he, he buys an indigenous bride from her family. And in the film, they're incorporated into the Chinese national family via a national romance plot. So a national romance plot is like this. She is Taiwanese, she's indigenous, and he is uh, Chinese from mainland China. And so they get married, and what happens to her? At the beginning of the film, she's dressed up in traditional Taiwan uh, attire, but as soon as she gets married, she becomes Taiwanese. She becomes Chinese, rather. She talks without an accent. In fact, the actress was not indigenous. She was just playing an indigenous person. And then she'll, she gets pregnant at the end, and she's carrying his, his child, and, and his child will be, will be Chinese. So uh, the indigenous people were symbolically incorporated into the Chinese national uh, family um, through films like this. You see, she's kind of an appendage to him. Her dress matches his, his tie, and then they're uh, saluting his, um, the leader of his uh, army unit. He used to be in the army. So they're saluting this representative of state power. <laughs> and she's declaring her, her uh, submission or her allegiance or her obedience to, to, to state power. So that's why it's unwatchable uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
In the second film, in Taipei Myth, Taipei Shenhua, 1985, Sunya's character stops for a rest in an Atile village. He gets tired of living in Taipei, and he, uh, he goes rogue. He's uh, driving a bus full of um, school children home. Like he drives a school bus, and then he says, I can't stand it anymore. I've got to get out of the city. And so he drives the school bus of children outside of the city to the sea. He wants to take them to the sea so they can go for a swim in the sea. And, um, and so he, he, he just goes by uh, an indigenous village. He stops, and, and this is the indigenous chief in this village. And he's not dressed up as an indigenous chief, uh, but he, he dresses up the children in a tile uh, uh, clothing. And then when they go inside, he changes into indigenous attire. So it's basically indigenous tourism. He's getting, giving him an authentic cultural experience. Um, okay. And the other film was um, The Tune Sign Painters, which is about exploitation of indigenous labor in the city, basically uh, abuse of indigenous workers in, in the city. The Two Sign Painters is about a young indigenous man who works with Sun Yue under abusive conditions as a sign painter. And this is the first decent indigenous film uh, in the history of Taiwan indigenous film. The actor who played the indigenous fellow is not indigenous. He was just a one-hit wonder. He was a singer who was popular briefly at that, that time, but uh, nobody's heard of him uh, now. And then Sun, he's sitting closest to us, and Sun Yue, the uh, fellow that just recently passed away, is sitting a farther away. And they're sitting up on this... Um, um, scaffolding, eight, flo eight stories up, um, uh, they're painting at the side of a building. So, so they're, they're, they're painting, painting this building. And then they make friends, and they discover that Sun Ye feels like the world is against him, and everyone takes advantage of him. Well, this indigenous fellow feels the same way. And so the director is kind of identifying uh, the sufferings of mainlanders, uh, former so mainland soldiers from the mainland, and uh, indigenous uh, people like this young man who's come to the city in search of the girl he, he loves. He can't, he can't find her and he ends up uh, working legally for below minimum wage uh, as, a, as, a, as a painter. I'm going to play this for you because it's got a kind of duet uh, between Sun Yue, who sings this um, sentimental song uh, from mainland China about where his home is. His home is in mainland China. And uh, that uh, the fellow on the right uh, place the song that I just cited as an example of how traditional indigenous communities have gotten fragmented. So, um, do you, can you uh, dim the lights? It's, it's about two minutes long. <laughs> trajectory in this presentation to the present. Trajectory isn't quite the right word because I want to emphasize indigenous agency. When indigenous people start to represent themselves, they tend to emphasize the possibilities in life for modern aborigines as they try to make themselves at home in the, in the modern world. 
There's a lot of previous research. Half of it is by me. And actually, I'm, I'm trying to stop doing this research. Uh, I don't have a strong studies background, and uh, I'm now working on indigenous translation. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe somebody here will. <laughs> I don't. I don't do don't do this research anymore. I was happy when 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 you asked me to, because I feel like I can be a cheerleader, a cheerleader. I can introduce people to these to these films, but. Um, my heart is elsewhere as a scholar, and I think other people can do this better than I can. I'm just doing the best I can here. The, um, the prize for the best uh, title goes to Vanessa Frangville, Aborigines in Taiwan uh, Communist Film, Mirror or Hammer, <laughs> which is a near rhyme, and uh, I guess Hammer is an allusion to Barefoot Brecht, that if uh, we're not going to mirror reality, we're not going to give you reality in, in a film, we're going to smash it. <laughs> and remake reality, because the reality of the world is unjust. Uh, but she, uh, Vanessa is not impressed by any of the films that she watches by non-indigenous directors. The films that she watches, she claims, are neither mirror nor hammer. They're just uh, light, easily digestible for armchair uh, tourists. OK, uh, themes in previous research that the films are unrealistic. Um, but what is a realistic film? My, my uh, reaction to that is what, is, what would it, a realistic indigenous film be? Because uh, if we define reality as whatever Japanese uh, ethnologists defined it <laughs> as, then um, a mi misrepresentation of a, of a construct from colonial Japan that might not have been accurate um, is uh, it's maybe questionable to call that un unrealistic or... Uh, what would realistic be? Um, uh, what's, what's the definition of reality that you're adopting? If, if you want uh, misrepresentation of, of indigenous cultures in uh, indigenous ethnic theme villages, well, it's realistic to portray the misrepresentation because it, it, it happens. Um, okay. Uh, and then, um, if reality is your objective present uh, life as it's really being lived in indigenous villages, what about indigenous... What about fantasies and projections? There are a lot of fantasies and projections in films made by indigenous people. Um, is that part of reality? It's, it's part of their imagination. It's, that must be part of reality, I would think. Um, the issue, I guess, is that uh, it, whose fantasies are there? Are, are these uh, fantasies indigenous fantasies or Chinese fantasies? Uh, when Chinese people make films or when Taiwanese people make films, it's ultimately probably going to be their fantasies and not indigenous fantasies. Themes in previous research. There are um, some numbers uh, to go from uh, theory to uh, uh, empirical data. <laughs> so we feel like we're on solid ground. Um, there are, uh, to my knowledge, 10.5 indigenous made films made, meaning films made with uh, indigenous actors playing indigenous characters, indigenous directed, the director is indigenous, the screenwriter is also uh, indigenous. 3.5 of those films were released in theater. So seven of the films are uh, made for TV, and 3.5 are uh, um, released in the theater. One is by Saki Nu, 2006. Uh, six made for TV movies by Ugin Boya. Two feature films by Laha Mibo. And uh, Lake Alsumi uh, co-directed uh, a feature film released in the theater, so I'll give him point, point 0.5. <laughs> I'll give him point 0.5, so that's, that's the point, that's the point 0.5. And he's done also a made-for-TV movie. So I'm going to focus on these, these three directors, Umi Boya, Laha La Mibo, and Lech Walsumi. We'll start with um, Saki Nu's uh, film, uh, which was not directed by Saki Nu, but it was uh, basically made by Saki Nu. I'll explain why in a second. Um, so just to get back to the question I asked, my main research question in uh, my abstract, how are the indigenous-made films different from the films made by Chinese or Taiwanese directors? Well, take a look. This is Umin Boya's uh, made-for-TV movie. A ten-year-old China. China means mother, so this is the ten-year-old mother. It's a ten-year-old who has to play the role of a mother in her family. Lahamibos, hang in there, kids, which uh, Daph was, uh, mentioned uh, when he introduced me. Boka uh, Laki is uh, something like Jiao, Xiao Hai, Xiao Hai, Hao Jiao. Go, uh, it's just words of encouragement for children. And finally, Lake Alsumi. Uh, Tsilanga San is uh, the holy mountain of the Pangcha 
um, he's people, and he has attached this to his name. His name is Lake Alsumi, but he often attaches this holy mountain to the end of his name. 2016, uh, Children of the Sun. Um, well, so how are these films different? Children. They're all about children, yeah. So I, I noticed this, and I started thinking about it. Is this interesting? <laughs> is it interesting that indigenous-made films are, are about children? And I've watched a lot of native features. Native features are features, uh, feature films made by indigenous filmmakers from around the world. And there's a book, a monograph, by an anthropologist called uh, Native Features. And this is apparently Pocahontas. <laughs> As a avenging angel, she comes back to the it's like a sci-fi Pocahontas. And um, if you've seen any f films uh, from around the world by indigenous directors, you think of Smoke Signals from the States, The Fast Runner from Canada, Once Were Warriors from New Zealand, Rabbit Proof Fence from Australia. Has anyone seen Walkabout? Yeah. It's a great film. That's about the only film that has children in it, but it's not for children. The film is not for children. The only film that Houston Wood mentions that's for children is Whale Rider, a New Zealand film directed by an indigenous, a, a, a New Zealand director, not an indigenous person, but uh, based on a novel by an indigenous writer, Witi uh, Ihimara. I hope I'm present, pronouncing it right. So, so it's striking that uh, indigenous films from Taiwan are all about children. How do we explain this? Well. Maybe it's just cheaper to make films about children, and it was just a budgetary, just budget. And, um, but I wasn't satisfied with the budgetary explanation of the content of these films, and so uh, I started thinking about Taiwanese film, and, and education. I mean, if it's a film about children, it's going to be about teaching your children well, right? Probably. And films about children are ultimately going to be about, about education in some way, in Taiwan, there are a lot of films that are about educating indigenous people, starting from Belle of Sayun in Japanese era. This is Sayun, and uh, she's in love with this uh, teacher, the teacher in her village that is called off to fight in, for the uh, emperor in the war. And uh, she very famously is a porter. She carries his luggage down to the train station, and while crossing a river, she falls in the river and dies. And she became celebrated for her devotion to the, to the emperor. But in the film, it seems like she's devoted to this teacher who must have educated her. In um, Wufong, uh, Wufong is famous for riding this red horse and giving the indigenous people of Taiwan his head in order to convince them uh, to stop headhunting. They, they wouldn't listen. He kept on saying, you must not headhunt. You shouldn't headhunt. It's not right. But they kept on headhunting. And so he said, well, this guy is going to come riding by this, this spot. You can take his head. It's OK. And so they do. They cut off his head and kill him. And they discover it's their friend, Ufong. And they uh, are so uh, distraught that they then vow not, never to headhunt again. So he's broadly speaking in a, uh, an educator, a teacher. And this is the young woman in, in the film that he, uh, he educates. So this is a part of Taiwan's indigenous films generally, education. In these early films, it's uh, education according to a, a Japanese or a Chinese ideal. And then in 1984, there was this film called Lao Su, uh, Sukayada, A Lily in the Valley. And it's about a Chinese teacher in an indigenous village. And it's also uh, unwatchable. <laughs> There's a bad guy. A bad guy. He's Chinese. And why is he a bad guy? You see, he looks like a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's married to a local woman, an indigenous woman, and you'll see he says, and he says, He's abusive to his wife, you're an idiot. He's always uh, calling his wife names. And um, he installs an arcade, ar arcade games in, in the store that he runs, so he's addicting kids to arcade games. He sells liquor to their parents. The parents are drunk all the time. And so the nun in the village wrote a song. <laughs> he sung Jie Jie Jiu Ge. And this is, this is the nun who wrote this song, and uh, a song convincing people to give up alcohol. And this is the teacher who is post the Chinese teacher who is posted to an indigenous village. And um, so they're the good guys. 
So the bad guys are Chinese, the good guys are Chinese. Where are the indigenous people? They're kind of like uh, grass in the wind. They blow this way and that. They don't have any agency. They're just influenced by these external forces. So this is the, um, the woman, and this is the doctor. He's also Chinese. He's also a good guy. She falls in love with him, and you see the students behind them. They end up marching in formation at the school. And uh, this is a statue of Sun Yat-sen. So it's an image like the one I showed of the, the saluting the departing uh, train. It's a signal of obedience to, uh, to the state, and so that's why, for me, it's un unwatchable now. It's not a pleasure to watch a film like this. 25 years later, so 2007, another pair of indigenous education films, meaning uh, films about Chinese teachers in indigenous villages, appeared. Song of the Spirits and Pong So No uh, Dao. Thanks to change for the better in that both directors of these films, both Chinese directors, were obviously more interested, I should say, Han, Han directors. Uh, they're just not indigenous people. They're uh, Han Chinese or, or Taiwanese directors. We're obviously more interested in indigenous culture than the director of this, this film, Lily in the Valley. Sorry. Especially indigenous music, and they're more confident in the, the ability of indigenous people to solve their own problems. But both directors included indigenous or interethnic romance between the Chinese teacher and a local girl as a reason for the teacher to keep teaching in the remote indigenous community. Either, otherwise, she'd get homesick and tired of living so far away, and she'd want to go home. But when she falls in love, then she can stay there forever. So in both films, romance is a distraction from education. These are these two films. And this is the Chinese teacher, and this is the uh, indigenous boy that she falls in love with, decides to stay in the community. So this is uh, the first indigenous film I'll talk about. Mountain boar, flying squirrels roar. I know flying squirrels don't, don't roar, but uh, I wanted to rhyme. Because uh, in Chinese, it's shan zhu fei shu sakinu. It's a rhyme in Chinese. Sakinu's hunting lore, the sage hunter. It's not directed by Sakinu. This is Sakinu. It was produced by a Taiwanese lady who is based in Hong Kong, who thinks that indigenous culture is good for non-indigenous souls. She's marketing indigenous culture to non-indigenous people who are nostalgic for a pre-modern lifestyle or tired of living in the city. And I met her in, in Taiwan. She wants me to translate Sakinu. Sakinu is a writer, so she wants me to translate his stories. She hired a Hong Kong director. Um, that's why it says a, a Tony Chung film. The director's from Hong Kong. Uh, but it's based on Sakinu's stories, and it stars Sakinu and his family. And so this is Sakinu playing, a character, playing himself in the movie. And that is Sakinu's son playing Sakinu's son in the movie. That is Sakinu's wife playing Sakinu's wife. <laughs> <In Asia. laughs> Sorry, so I'm, I'm saying it's indigenous me. And he passes on traditional skills in the forest and at the hunter's school. So these are the little boys in the community in this hunting lodge uh, that is, is there actually in his community. He built this hunting lodge and he actually has a hunter's school. So the movie is about this hunter's school, uh, traditional education that he, he, he runs in his uh, village in Taidong. This is from his book. Um, just, I, I think Sakini's writing is pretty good, so uh, better than the movie. I don't really like the movie very much, but uh, the acceptance of foreign culture, the invasion of foreign culture, and the fragmentation of the tribal social structure have denuded our bodies. I try to be as literal as possible. Denuded our bodies of the totemic tattoos of the Paiwan people. The helplessness and hesitation of my tribe's people have struck us utterly in our deepest, innermost, indigenous worlds. And I think it's, it's great. <laughs> it's, uh, Akinu is great. I'm, I'm pretty good, too. But um, <laughs> I, I think the writing uh, works in translation. It translates well, I, I think. And I just, as I said, try to be as literal as possible. The stories are, are for children. At night, you used to hear flying squirrels wooing each other. Often, the entire valley resounded with rhythmic wooing sounds when five or six flying squirrels stopped to sing the song of love on a tree. A magnificent scene. The last time I heard, I heard such a thing was when I uh, was in secondary school. Since then, I've seldom heard their mating calls in the valley. So there's been a kind of decline of nature, like an environmental problem. 
Who is responsible for this decline in nature? There are several reasons why the flying squirrels disappeared. Destruction habitat, so I don't know who's responsible for that. The overuse of crossbow and the abuses of unscrupulous hunters. So it sounds like he's, he's uh, blaming uh, his own tribe's people for using modern technology to hunt. That's the way it seems to me. No matter how many flying squirrels there were, hunting them day and night with advanced technology could only end in, distinction, in extinction. But in the movie, in the movie, it's the state that's to blame because the state wants to build a highway. They want to move the community to make way for a highway. And so Sakinu goes to Taipei, and this is uh, Takishimaya until quite recently, until about 10 years ago, the tallest building in Taiwan. And he happens to run into this transportation bureaucrat, the bureaucrat from the Ministry of Transportation, somebody who's helping to plan the, this highway. And uh, he happens to run into this guy, and his daughter is here, passed out um, in front of uh, this department store because she spent all night playing video games. So, and then he heals her with a couple of herbs that he's gathered from the forest in Taidong. And um, it's obviously, he's trying to say that Chinese people are, or non-indigenous people in Taiwan don't know how to raise their children. But he does, of course. So he takes this guy, this transport bureaucrat to Taidong, and introduces him to his wife. Um, his wife is from Tainan, she's Pingbu, Pingbu Zhu. And the guy asks, well, are you used to living here? And she says, yeah, yeah, it's home now. I like it here. And that's Sasaki Moon's youngest child at the time, now 15 years old. Time is passing quickly. And then in the end, they convince this guy not to build a highway, so they call it off. And, um, and this is the uh, at the end of the movie. It's a surprisingly bad cartoon. And I, I put it up here just to say that the movie, I think, was mainly aimed at, uh, at children. It's not just about children. It's it's made uh, partly or mainly for children. And the character in the cartoon riding a motorcycle, he's a forest cop because Saki New's job is, uh, he's, he works for the um, Department of Forestry. Uh, and there's a kind of missed opportunity here to make a movie about uh, abuses, hunting related abuses and uh, poaching of animals and forest products. Um, which is a real problem in Taiwan. It it's partly involves indigenous people who, who hunt in order to sell for the market, but there are also this organized crime that uh, often use escaped guest workers and get them to extract products from uh, whether animal, animal products or, or wood products uh, from the forest. This is a big problem. And maybe indigenous hunters have a role to play here because they if, it, if something is their hunting ground, nobody else is going to go there without them knowing about it. These people could help uh, control this problem. But as I say, it's a miss, uh, missed opportunity. The film doesn't deal with this issue at, at all. It's just about um, opposition, nimbious opposition to this, this highway um, and about passing on tradition, hunting tradition, uh, from father to son. The next two directors went to Shishin Dashue which is located in Taipei, very close to Baozangyan, where you're going to go and um, do your residency as an, as an artist. It's about a kilometer walk south of Baozangyan, and it has a very famous uh, mass communications program. So a lot of people in Taiwan's commercial film industry went through Shishin Dashue, and uh, including several important indigenous directors. First, uh, Umin Boya. Umin Boya this is a film uh, by a director called Zhen Wentang, Hui Gui Bulo Assembu Chu. Has anyone heard of the Return to the Village trilogy? It's okay if you haven't. Um, he's six foot four and very handsome. And so he was, um, he was first cast in idol dramas for 16 or 17 year olds and became famous as a, an actor in idol, idol dramas, just for a mainstream audience. And he wasn't playing an indigenous character. Um, but it turns out he's not just another pretty face. He's always had an aspiration to be a director and to make films about indigenous uh, communities. The first film he made for TV uh, was uh, for a television station called GTV. And this is the typical kind of thing that GTV makes. My boy. So it's just a silly romance. Why 
would he make his first made-for-TV movie about an, an indigenous village, about poor people in an indigenous village, um, through, through GTV. So da Davith was wondering this, and, and as a result of uh, Davith's question, why GTV? I got in touch with GTV and uh, asked the producer, what, what was GTV thinking? Like, this is not commercial. The, the film that, that Umin Boya made was not commercial. Why did you produce this? So, she wanted to enter the film uh, into the Golden Bell Awards. If it won an award, it would in improve ratings. And um, she's also an, an idealist, it seems. She wanted to reorient GTV towards wholesome, quality programming that would generate positive social energy. <laughs> so, I don't know if this generates positive <laughs> social energy, but that's what she had in mind. You might think she means healthy realism, which is uh, basically uh, seeing the world through rose-colored glasses, but Umin Boya in his first film gives us honesty, a ten-year-old mother's wish. It's set in South Hualien, where um, Umin Boya is from, and it looks like the area around Shishang, if anyone's been to Taiwan, it's rice field country. Walking home from school, anxious, anxious apprehension, they really, the, ah, can you see the screen? It's a bit dark. Maybe all the pictures are too dark. Yeah. Can you see it? Or? Do you want uh, to yeah. I'll show you a clip in a second, but just take my word for it. There's anxious apprehension on her face. <laughs> Why is she so worried? Because she's, she's looking over in this uh, still at her uh, two uh, siblings, her younger brother and sister, for whom she's responsible. So uh, the state visits and says, well, are you able to care for your children as a single father? And uh, so this is, uh, this is the daughter, Paylene, and her name is Paylene. And he says, yes, of course, you can't take my children away, because they're suggesting that they put one or two of his children into foster care. And so they ask him, well, what do you do for a living? And he says, zuo jia, which usually in Chinese means that he's a writer, like Saki Nu. But he means that he's in construction. He makes houses. And so this illustrates his lack of facility in Mandarin. And it's, it's a joke but uh, at, at his expense, but it illustrates his uh, poor language skills in Mandarin. And the, the film is basically about Paylene uh, making house, taking care of her, her siblings. So uh, poor little girl, um, the director arranges for her, her wishes to come true. Uh, this is an angel, uh, there's a character in a TV show where they make indigenous children's uh, wishes come true and they go on this TV show and they, they, uh, they win the prize, they win all this uh, household appliances which they probably can't afford to power. <laughs> they couldn't pay the electrical bills to, to, to power these electrical appliances. But... And then she, she I guess, asked, what is your wish, what do you want? And she has this fantasy, like something out of Pocahontas. Uh, but then she doesn't answer for the longest time. And finally she answers. I'm going to play you this clip. Can you, can we uh, dim the lights? This is the, the second of three clips that I would like to play for you. Okay. Not harmful to our system. So in this scene, uh, the father is here and he's doing this uh, kind of skill testing task. He's bouncing a ping pong ball. I mean, you see how low budget this made for TV movie is when the, the skill that they're testing is the ability to bounce a, a ping pong ball. Cool. This is part of the, the low budget that the film, um, that he was given to make the film. He had 60,000 American dollars to make, to make this film. Okay, and you'll see what happens in a second. Is he going to pass this uh, skill testing uh,
congratulations. And so the first time in the movie, she looks happy. So the most important thing is that you get to make a wish. The most important thing is not the electrical appliances, it's that you get to make a wish. So she hasn't responded in time, so they can't make a TV program. We've got to make a TV program here. You've got to tell us what you want. So they cut, and then they'll, they'll start filming again. And throughout the whole production process, the host is uh, impatient with uh, the family, uh, as is the producer. And when this angel comes, and she reassures her, and, and Haley keeps on looking at her, because uh, it's like the mother that she doesn't have. Her, her real mother has abandoned the family. And she gets another chance to make her wish. Village in uh, in, in uh, Taipei, Xinjiang. 
So, Bao Zhang Yan, the, uh, the art artist community that you're going to be living in, is uh, kind of north of here. It's within walking distance, though. You could walk down to this village called Chito Village, indigenous village, and it's about a mile away from, what, about five kilometer walk from the university where the character in the film is studying, like Louis Boya. So he's uh, focusing our attention on how indigenous images are produced, how indigenous movies are, are produced, and she ends up wandering five kilometers one day and discovering this indigenous village and deciding to make a film about this, uh, this village. But why, why is it not called Shijo? Why is it called Heaven? Because there's a document, a famous documentary by a guy called Mayo Biho. He's a famous documentary filmmaker. Here he is. He made a film called Children of Heaven about a very similar village called uh, Sanipulo. And it's called Sanipulo because this is the bridge between Sanxia and Inga. It's two communities in Taiwan. And these people lived by the side of a river under this bridge. And they were migrants, some East migrants, who had nowhere, nowhere else to go. They didn't have money to pay rent, and so they ended up living in this village, and, and the, uh, the government tore it down several times. And uh, that's the kind of climax of this documentary. It's also the climax of uh, Umin Boya's uh, made-for-TV movie, Heaven Gets Raised, in this scene. And there's a cross-cutting sequence where they cross to two different places that things are happening at the same time. And at the same time, uh, one of the boys from the village is going with this student from um, Shishin University, and they're playing with balloons. He accidentally lets go of one of the balloons, lets go of one of the balloons, and so they decide to let go of all of the balloons. And it's also a very uh, kind of crude, made-for-TV movie with a very, very low budget. But Uwing Boya likes these kind of symbolic scenes where it's okay to let go. Actually, we, we don't need our, our village. We can rebuild. We don't need these balloons. We can, we can let them go. Make it a little bit obvious. <laughs> this is um, his other film, Periada uh, Julie. It's the kind of swaying bamboo grove. And it's about grandfather takes grandson to uh, their kind of traditional uh, tribal lands, but um, the government has taken them away from them. They've been deterritorialized, and so they no longer have the right to harvest, in this case, bamboo shoots. And the, they get discovered by the cops, and the grandfather says, run away, run away. Don't get caught. The father works for the uh, Department of Forestry, so he's conflicted, and maybe the conflict will be re resolved by the, the son. And the son has this uh, superhero figurine, and this is a stolen bamboo shoot. So it's another striking image. I don't know. What do you think it means? It's a kind of uh, an action hero figurine and a, and a stolen bamboo shoot. Well, it's it's a symbolic image, and, and Umin Boy, as I said, is kind of fond of scenes like this. Umin Boy is famous today in Taiwan, not just as an actor, also as the director of Kano, the the baseball movie. Have you have you seen Kano? And it's completely different from his made-for-TV movies. His made-for-TV movies are obviously kind of crude. They can't have very much, there's not very much money for background music or for professional actors or for anything, or for, for sets, for uh, shooting a, a film in, in, a, in a certain location. Cano is the work of a polished professional. So I think maybe uh, Umi Boya will be the first uh, indigenous director in Taiwan to make an epic feature film, a big budget blockbuster uh, feature film. But Cano is not that film. The first director to make a film uh, that was released in, in a theater, an indigenous director, first feature film released, directed by an indigenous director, was by La Hamibo. This is a um, famous actor in Taiwan now, Li Ting Tai, who uh, is in her first feature film here, and he was the star of uh, Sadik uh, Balai, Sadik Balai. Uh, Warriors of the Rainbow, have, have, have any of you seen this? Are we all getting tired of these, these films? I know I'm exhausting, it's already been an hour. <laughs> um, I'll start going quickly. Going quickly. And this is a, an amateur actor from her home village that she's cast in the role of protagonist in her first feature film. Okay. Uh, she is from uh, Nanao, which is here, sort of uh, eastern Taiwan, halfway down the coast of uh, the east coast. A director comes to their village. There's their village to make a romance about Sayun, whom I, I mentioned about half an hour ago now, from the Japanese film about the girl that died 
because she was in love with her teacher, but actually she was used in propaganda uh, because she was so devoted for, to the emperor. The, the movie was made to get people to sign up, to volunteer to fight to, in the Japanese war effort. So she comes to the village to make a film about Sayun, and she finds Sayun. A Sayun is a common name in, in, uh, in their language. And you can't see this, but uh, her, 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 her t-shirt says, Vintage Style. <laughs> and I think it's somehow ironic. Really. I think it's clever. And she is a student in grade 12. And uh, so the director says, well, why don't I make a movie about Sayun and her boyfriend, uh, Yugen? They're not actually going out to me. He's in love with her, but uh, she's studying for her college entrance exam. So she doesn't want to make a movie, and uh, um, she doesn't want to, to have a romance with Yugen. So the, the, the plan to make this romance about Sayun is the plan <coughs> She's not able, the director's not able to make this film, and so instead she makes a, uh, a documentary about the village, about going to church, slaughtering pigs, playing in the waterfall pool, helping grandma with the laundry, practicing soccer, uh, going hunting with grandpa, and uh, hunting at night. You hunt squirrels with night, at, at night with lights, because you can blind them, and they kind of go like, oh. <laughs> and you shoot them, and that's, that's what you do. And eating wild honey. And um, I mentioned uh, fantasies and projections. This is a fantasy on the wall here. This is a, a pre-modern Sayun in this mural. And in standing in front of the wall is this modern-day Sayun. And she's a widow. Her husband died because he was doing dangerous work. Indigenous people often do work nobody else wants to do. The, the gap, they don't get guest workers to do it. So. It, DDD, triple D jobs, dirty, dangerous, and uh, degrading, I think. So her, her husband's passed away, and it's obviously supposed to be a contrast between appearance and reality, fantasy and uh, reality. It's as if she's saying this, this uh, image of, a, of, of Sayun in uh, the bosom of nature is, is unreal. And that the reality of living in an indigenous village today is uh, of being a widow with a young child. And, but actually, this is La Amigo's Facebook page, and so I think this is a fantasy, kind of, uh, a fantasy of the director uh, her, herself. Uh, part of her idea of who she, she is or who she wants to be, as a fantasy, it's part of maybe who she wants to be. Maybe she too wants to live in the, in the bo bosom of nature. Um, she grew up in uh, Taichung and Taipei, and I think she got tired of living in the big city, and she went on a, a root-seeking mission. She went back to her own village, and part of that involved uh, getting getting closer to nature. And this is this is the same mural, and this is from the movie, but this is actually in the village, and it's still in the village today, looking over the people of this village like a fairy godmother. So I think it's really nice. And the uh, the art is by this guy called Miru uh, Hayong, who's a tile artist, and he does a lot of public art in the tile villages around the, the country. I ran into his brother. His brother is also an artist. Public a tile artist. Source of truth. So how much money did this film make? 2.2 million NT dollars, about 70,000 US. So this is just <laughs> pathetic if you compare it to the, uh, the box office of a typical American film. But it was enough for her to convince investors to give her more money to make her second film. Her second film made 233,000 uh, US dollars at the box office in part because it was Taiwan's entry into the best foreign picture at the Academy Awards 2016. Kind of surprising, I think. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. And then the, the, uh, the other, the third um, feature film by the indigenous director uh, made about 200,000. So th those are the numbers we're talking about. Not, uh, not big dip budget. Like um, Whale Rider was made with $30 million, a budget of $30 million American dollars, and it, and, and it had hundred million dollars of the budget box office, it's about a hundred times more than films in, in Taiwan. So the second film, I I'll, I'll, can go quicker uh, from now on, uh, about three indigenous boys from uh, Huansan Bulo. This is the village that they live in up in the mountains. This is the location of the village in uh, central Taiwan mountain range. 
Again, this is the three, the three uh, boys. They are representative of a family situation, a dream in life, and an orientation for tr to tradition. So the first little boy is Watan, and so he's more traditional. He wants to stay in the village. And that's why he's called Watan. And the other two boys are called uh, uh, Lin Shan. He has a Chinese name. And then uh, the third boy is called Chen Hao. He also has a Chinese name. Watan is the only little boy who goes by his indigenous name. So it's a special orientation tradition. His dream in life is to stay in the village. And he doesn't have either parent. He's being raised by his grandmother in a house that's being, been pieced together out of, uh, out of uh, waste plastic and uh, fiberboard and whatever they found lying around. So it's, it's really a primitive uh, kind of uh, house that they live in. You can kind of see that the roof there is, is sagging. Um, it's about to fall over, basically. The other little boy, the second little boy, oops, I spilled my water. Not a lot of water, don't worry. He is uh, a single parent family. His, his father uh, raises him, and they live in a proper shack made of uh, um, uh, tiepi, tiepi. They live in a shack made out of iron siding with a, with a roof. And his father is uh, a peach farmer. They uh, put uh, these um, uh, bags over the, the peaches with uh, foam to stop the bugs from eating them. And in the movie, Watan says that Dai Taozi, Dai Taozi, Dai Taozi is to put on a condom, actually. <laughs> it's, it's like to put on a condom, but he uses, he knows what it means, but he uses it to refer to uh, uh, seasonal agricultural work, putting these bags on the fruit so that the insects don't eat them. So Watan is a really clever little boy. Yeah. Uh, and a really tough little boy, too, I'll show you in a second. Lin Shan, he has both parents, but his dad's an alcoholic and beats his wife. And uh, so here's a, a scene where they've just come out of uh, this uh, after school, school after school. And none of these movies, all of these movies are about children. They're not set in a school, but they uh, are all about a traditional or non-formal kinds of education. This is just a, an after school class run by the local church where the kids get help with their homework and they get taught a bit of traditional language and traditional customs and songs. And uh, the father wants to be a, uh, a singer. That's his band. That's his band in real life. The father is played by one of the members of the, the band. They're called boxing, like fighting boxing. And they do kind of Latin American indigenous fusion <laughs> music. They're, they're not bad. Um, and then this is after school class that they go to to learn about uh, indigenous culture. They also hunt, so I'll just end with this. Um, they also hunt illegally. They hunt a mud jack and they sell it. So that's illegal too. Uh, to, uh, this is a famous actor in Taiwan, a variety uh, TV show uh, star. And uh, they also sell peaches uh, illegally. They steal peaches from Chen Hao's father. They steal the peaches and then they sell them. Uh, at the market. It's illegal because they don't have a license. So there's a one of the, the fellows here with a stall, he says, you don't have a license, you can't sell peaches. And so so Watan tells him to F off in Taiwanese. As I said, he's a tough little boy. And then they say, uh, help out uh, Aboriginal kids. Uh, uh, he, he, um, he kind of manipulates his audience. He elicits their sympathy for uh, indigenous kids like him. He doesn't need their sympathy. He's just trying to sell his peaches. <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, You're a knockout lady. Come and buy his peaches. <laughs> so he ends up selling his peaches for, uh, for a pretty good price. Okay. And then uh, at the end of the movie, he says, uh, Things don't, don't always work out the way we plan, but uh, we, can, we can search for our own goals in the future. So... Allah Hamibo, as a director, always makes what she's trying to say to the, to the children in the audience uh, extremely obvious. And I, I asked her if there was any response, audience response, to her, her film. And the, the children that watched the film all, all wanted to see what's going to happen to these kids when they grow up. Should, should they want a sequel? Third director, I'll go through this very quickly, I'm sorry, is uh, Lekal Asumi uh, Tsilagasan. Uh, his story is connected to his mother. That's his mother. They are. They grew up. In, he grew up in Tainan, but uh, Shi Ping is this uh, Amis community in southern Guadian. And so, uh, the mother went back to her home village, and she uh, um, she restored traditional 
Rice agriculture, so who is asking about rice? Who's interested in, in rice? Yes, this would be a good film for, for you because she uh, restored the irrigation and uh, she did it uh, as a community effort and then they restore paddy rice agriculture by the ocean. And then they've been, she's been telling people what she did every chance she gets for, for 15 years now. This is a, a movie called uh, Haidaomi, the uh, dream of the oceanside rice, the who wants, so the breath of the oceanside rice. This is another TV show. There are about 10 different TV shows that she's she shared her story uh, on. This is a documentary. Actually, there are two documentaries about her achievement of restoring this irrigation line and, and uh, oceanside uh, rice farming. Um, and this one was by uh, just a director she hired, and this is by her son, Lake Osumi. So um, multiple different versions of, of her story um, in documentary format. And so Lake Osumi um, uh, joined up with this uh, experienced director to make a feature film. Why do they need this experienced director? Because he has no experience, and nobody's going to give him money to make a feature film. I'm not, they're not going to give him $200,000 to make a feature film, and probably lose everything because he doesn't know how to do it. Um, and so this uh, Chinese director, a uh, non-indigenous uh, Taiwanese director, was brought on to help him technically. And that's the, uh, that's the poster for the film. That's the main character of the film, painted by Yossi Fu. <laughs> Another example of uh, indigenous public art. You can check out his, his website. This is the, uh, um, uh, one of the, the trains to the East Coast. What's the fast train to the East Coast called? The Payuma Hao, yes, yes, yes. It's been painted with art by Yossi Fu. And this is the feature film. What's different between the documentaries and the feature film? The answer, once again, is they put children. It's about children. The feature film is about children, whereas the documentary, there were no children in the documentary. Um, the film, feature film is, is a lot more dramatic than the documentary. And uh, so Benai is the main character. She is a reporter, reporting here on 2014 occupation of the legislature. And uh, she does a story on indigenous uh, rule in this, um, in, the, in the protest. And they pull the story because uh, Ji Pai Mei, Ji, Ji Pai Mei is the uh, uh, go her, her, her bosom, her, what's that, decolletage. Her, 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 the, the top half of her breasts are, are exposed, I think. <laughs> she goes around, I think this happens most of the time, that her breasts are, are half exposed. This is her role in life, I think. Chief Chief I May, she's uh, a famous entertainer. She's actually a very interesting person, and she's kind of an activist in her own right, and has embraced a lot of activist causes. But she, she becomes famous because she's, she, she, she's beautiful and uh, did a, uh, a book of her, of her scantily clad uh, oh. photographs. And that's why, why, why she's famous, not as an activist. Okay, so she, she decides to quit her job as a, as, a, as a reporter, go home because her dad is sick. So but the director, when they turned it into a feature film, they made it a lot more dramatic. So she has a sick father now, and her daughter is performing for the tourists. And there are tour buses, so tourism is impacting life in the traditional community and land is for sale, it's being bought up by people that want to build uh, bed and breakfasts. They also want to build a hotel, a resort hotel for Chinese tourists. And if you know anything about the Taiwan history in the last little while, Taiwan is now the president and uh, not very many Chinese tourists are coming. So if they had built the hotel, there'd be nobody to, to stay in it. But um, so here the, this girl, little girl's um, image is used in this advertisement uh, without her permission. It's a misuse of indigenous images uh, to build resort hotels. Uh, and then this guy says, if you build a hotel in our village community, it's not going to be like a village community anymore. We don't want your darn hotel. And uh, there's actually a lot about what it means to live in the, in the traditional village community in the film. The film is kind of like a definition of what is life in a traditional village community. Uh, here they're um, they're confronted by uh, riot police because they're trying to defend their, their land. They're trying to defend the, uh, the, the field in which they planted the rice. The riot police try, try to come and move them away to make room for this um, hotel. And so this old lady says, where is your bulo? 
to this uh, riot policeman who is himself uh, a Mise. He is in, himself from the village. And then at, at the end of this scene, the riot police clear the, clear the road, but then the daughter of, of Benai, the, uh, the main character, whose name, in fact, means Rice. Benai, the name of the main character means Rice. This is her daughter, it's a cow. She, she goes in front of the, uh, the backhoe, Dang Zhe Mei, the, the girl who blocked the backhoe, and it's kind of like Tank Man in uh, the Tiananmen <laughs> Massacre, and this gets on the news, another misuse of indigenous images, but for a good cause. And so people see this, see this story, and they understand the problem, and then they, they decide to buy all the rice. So as a result of this incident, uh, she sells out the rice crop for the year, and of course they'll be able, hopefully, to, to plant rice uh, next year. So, for young people, the Bulu is a place to come home to. Even though they can't speak their mother tongues, even if they don't know their indigenous names, at least they still have a Bulu. Qing troops force them to move by military means. Chinese investors are trying to force them to move by monetary means, but at least now, children still have a Bulu. Bulu means the roof, roofs over their heads on which they sometimes sleep under the stars, the fields in which they conduct rituals to the ancestors who watch over them from the sacred mountain, and the meeting area where they dance their traditional um, dance at the uh, annual harvest. Bulu home in the film is a prices quality that can't be quantified, like the economic benefits that a resort hotel might bring. Uh, and uh, at the end of the film, uh, this is the main character's daughter. She says, who are you? Bangza, she, she says, I'm not, a, I'm not a, ashamed to say that I'm an indigenous person. I belong to the Bangza tribe, and she's uh, going to get a, a, a running scholarship. So at the end of this movie, life is going to take her away from the, uh, the, the, the traditional tribal village. So we get the trajectory is repeating itself, going away from home, failing, coming back, and then going, going away again. So hopefully this time they won't fail. And uh, a lot of the dialogue in the film is uh, in Amis. Which is nice. It's the of all the films. No need to turn it off. Okay, so she just decides to come home and she has a conversation in Hamis with her father, and uh, it's subtitled in Mandarin uh, and English. The only thing they could do better is to subtitle it with both languages, Mandarin and Hamis or uh, English and uh, Amis. But so far, no movie has done this yet in the subtitling. The other thing to say about this movie, it was the theme song was very successful. The, um, on the back, you'll see that uh, I've translated the theme song into English. The theme song is by Suming. He's a, a famous uh, Amis artist, probably the most famous indigenous singer in Taiwan. And... Um, there's a link down here, it won the Golden Horse Award for the best uh, theme song in, in 2015 and a Golden Melody Award in 2016. And uh, the spelling is a total mess. Uh, in Amis, the spelling of the Amis words is not standard. He kind of made up the spelling based on how it sounded. And so there's a website here commenting on the grammar if you're interested and also uh, analyzing the mistakes that he made and how it should be. So I've corrected it. This is the corrected version of the, of the lyrics. So I'll just play a little bit. So she's running. She's going to get this running scholarship. It's one of the highlights of the movie. This is a me. This is Sumi. It's just a simple little song. trying to hear the, the words that, uh, that he's singing. And it's really nice that he's done so, d done so well for himself. Okay, uh, last film I'll talk about is uh, this film. Uh, it's basically, um, this is the father in the movie, and this is a member of this uh, young fellow, who's the protagonist, member of his age set, the Mies Society that age sets, as uh, um, previous speaker was talking about, and he's teaching him to fish. 
And this is a, an indigenous girl. They fall in love, of course. And then uh, she is an indigenous lady who runs a bed and breakfast. And so she's teaching her how to cook and how to run a bed and breakfast. So um, she's passing on a traditional ability that's economically relevant that this young woman might use to, to support herself. But what about fishing? Teaching him how to fish, but he can't fish for a living, can he? And then it struck me that we're going to get married and we're going to run a bed and breakfast together. He's going to fish and she's going to cook the fish uh, for <laughs> tourists and that's how they'll, they'll support themselves. Themselves. So it's traditional education that uh, they'll be able to support their lifestyle. Okay, so uh, it's a kind of unambitious, uh, kind of heavy-handed uh, little, little made-for-TV movie. Okay, that's it. So empirical. I've demonstrated a focus on children between 8 and 18 in indigenous-made films that is not blurred by romance. For the kids in these movies, the school is not the main place where they learn. They learn in the home or the village, and their teachers are loved ones or members of local communities like age sets who teach them survival skills and economic abilities. Okay. How do we explain the, these empirical findings? Well, you can refer to the budget uh, or the particularities of, of every production, but I want to generalize. I generalized in two ways in terms of discipline. Discipline in the post-war period partly by the national education system, which aimed at turning members of communities into citizens, and aimed at fragmenting traditional communities. Uh, indigenous people are putting their communities back together by focusing on relations between parents and children, and in terms of domestication, domesticated by power ex exercised partly through the national education system. Indigenous people are now self-domesticating, making themselves at home, trying to teach their children well. To do that, they're trying to teach their children well, to help their children make their way in the world, though uh, not at the expense of the world. Most of these homes have an environmentalist uh, theme in one way or another by virtue of traditional education. There is much more to say. Uh, right now, you could write a number of essays about uh, the relationship between uh, films made by indigenous people and uh, other forms of indigenous art or media, music art, also literature. In a few years, we will see big budget epics by indigenous directors, avant-garde experiments, and our tourist masterpieces. But so far, uh, formally, there is nothing really uh, that distinguishes these films as films. These films are not comments on film as a, as a medium. They, they're just trying to tell a story in pretty conventional film language. Meanwhile, Non-indigenous directors are still making films. Two films in the past year about Orchid Island. This is uh, Mermaid Whispering. It's a, it's a Orchid Island exploitation film. It's just trashy uh, romance uh, <laughs> for, for armchair tourists. And that Montaigne No Sea is about um, a teacher. It's another te a Chinese teacher in a remote indigenous community who falls in love with this is this handsome fellow. So, in both of these films, uh, romance is a distraction from education and rebuilding communities, which I think is what we should really be concerned about. Thank you very much. Okay. What I, what I, really, I really loved the, the paper and I loved the presentation um, uh, even, even more. Um, I, I think what also helped was the fact that we'd seen a number of these, these films. Um, we've, we've seen uh, Finding Sayu, we've seen Hanging Their Kids, um, and we've seen uh, Panaya. We actually had the dialogue with, with uh, Alor. Um, yeah, she came uh, here. That's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, she, she's, uh, well, like you, uh, she, she came here for the first time and then had such a good time she wanted to, uh, to come back. So, the first time we did the, uh, let me see, the, with the screening, yeah. plus a talk on, um, indigenous social movements. And the second time she did a concert, uh, plus a talk on her experiences in the uh, indigenous media. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, um, I think she's in um, Holland now. So she's, in, she's back in Europe, she likes. Uh, but let me just come to one question, and I'm sure the audience have got a lot of questions as well. Um, um, I was curious a little bit about uh, the audience responses uh, to these films. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do um, hand toweling viewers, um, do they want this uh, romance? 
I mean, are, are these films actually being um, well received? Um, and and how are these films actually received by indigenous audiences? Um, um, I guess that question applies to, to both types, the kind of exploitation type or stereotypical type of uh, film that are made by um, uh, Taiwanese directors um, and those that are actually made by um, indigenous directors. So that, um, I don't know. Um, my impression is that Long Time No See, the last film I mentioned, is selling quite well. The director is very sincere. She spent a lot of time with the people in the village and um, got to know them and, and cast them in the film. Spent five years apparently planning her film, but it's just horrendous. It's overacted and, um, um, and as I said, she uh, casts uh, the leading role of a Chinese teacher in, in the community, falls in love with a local girl. It's just a cliche. Um, audience response, to, is that what audience want? Do, do we want this kind of film? Terrible. Um, I don't know what she was thinking. But uh, those are good questions that you, that you asked, and I don't know. Uh, and I, and I wonder how I'd, I'd have to interview her and then look at, uh, at reviews. I think there's a, a tendency, um, if it's uh, a local film made about indigenous people, not to say anything nasty about it. Right. Okay. Like if you're writing a film, film review and it's the latest Hollywood or whatever, you can write a nasty review. Um, but even if a local film is, is poorly done, it's you try to usually critics will handle it with kid kid uh, kid gloves. Is that the expression? But I don't know the answer. I'll have to go and do some more research. So you've, you've interviewed some of these indigenous directors, have you? Yeah. And um, uh, did they ever talk about what the audience response uh, among indigenous audience was like? And you just just what I mentioned. That, just to, uh, yeah, about what happens next. Yeah, yeah. Um, I talked to. Um, a police officer who, work, who works in the community that uh, Lahamibo is from, and he said he hadn't bothered to go see it, and because um, he wasn't cast in the movie. So when, they, when, they, when, when she involved the community in the making of the film, it's not like everybody in the community is right. involved. It's just a few people, and he said he couldn't be bothered. And I heard it was, I heard it, uh, it wasn't very good. And mm -hmm. I said I, I loved it, and I kind of been in tears. <laughs> at that third viewing, that uh, was just a, a, a really interesting uh, film with $60,000 budget. She made a kind of um, self-reflexive film. It's, it's, it's a meta-film. Is that right, Crystal? She made a film about the making of a film designed to get us to question how these images are, are produced. So in, in its own little way, it's, it's a pretty sophisticated take on, on, on what it uh, what the process of filming in an indigenous community is and uh, um, and there was the Chinese angle in that film as well yeah well she got some funding from mainland China so uh, oh, right mm -hmm. like uh, in in the film the director comes to the village as the assistant director the director's in Beijing and she calls him and says reports on her progress and then her film crew they're two mainland Chinese fellows and so in the review in the time with Tucker Times they say well I bet she got funding from, from mainland China, and I interviewed her, and he said, yes, in fact, she did. And so that one must have got screened near China as well, then? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Well. I think you're right, but I will have to check on that. Okay, let's open to some um, uh, questions. Who would like to start? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just want to know, because you, you talk so many um, types of uh, in, well, films either by or about indigenous peoples, which one is your worst uh, nightmare? You think this is really awful, and which one is your um, most favorite one? So can you say why? Um, the, the worst one is a film like Wufong. Uh, Mm -hmm. <laughs> or uh, the um, well, more and second spring of, of old Mr. Moore. They're just it's so obvious, and it's so uh, the message that they're trying to send is so objectionable. It's just basically Chinese nationalism, loyalty to the state. It's horrible. And 
and um, yeah. They are all made by Yu Han Ping, so it's either Lao Mo the Train Tail or Yang Yu Qi Jiang. Yang Yu Qi Jiang, yeah. That's my first film that I really liked. Yeah. Same director. Yeah, the same director, yeah. The same director for, um, same actor for all three movies, yeah. the same director for Taipei Shenhua and Yang Yu Qi Jiang. The first one was directed by somebody else. But by well known well known directors. I think two different directors for that trilogy. Two of the films are by one director and, and one of the films is by I think uh El Morte de is, is by a different director from uh uh Nebeo Chi Chung. Taipei Sun was terrible. My favorite movies are um Benai. I didn't like it the first time because I thought it was kind of political and obvious way. It was too obvious what it was trying to say. Um but I, I watched it again and I felt very touched by it. And as I said, I uh, always am overcome by emotion when I watch um, uh, that. Um, the one, the part that gets me is in uh, Seeking Sayun or Finding Sayun, the one, first one by Lahan Nebo. Um, I'm going to give the plot away, but <laughs> it's a plot developed involving this guy's grandfather that is. Um, hey, the film manages to touch you, and it seems sincere. It doesn't seem like she's trying to manipulate your emotions. And uh, she has, she, has uh, she, she got my respect. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm someone who sees through, sees through attempts to, to manipulate me emotionally. Does it mean that sincerity is something yeah. you really want? Yeah, so I'm not a very sophisticated uh, <laughs> uh, film goer. I'm not a very sophisticated film critic, but that's my favorite film, and that's why. And I, I can say that they're, they're both films that uh, were pretty popular here. I know the audience love those two. Ah, mm. uh, yeah, Adam. Um, thanks, Daryl. That was, that was um, fantastic. Um, I was trying to think about your question, your basic question about why are these about children, um, particularly since just personally I find I have a very, very low tolerance for films about children. Yeah, um, uh, And I inevitably find them saccharine, and even yeah. if they're well done. I have seen, I think it was a previous one of your talks that I attended a couple of years ago, possibly, but one of those movies, and I liked it very much, the one with the, uh, the peaches. Yes, that was uh, yeah, the... Uh, the right. Farmer, yeah. So I enjoyed that and one. Their kids. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, but generally I, I really don't like movies about children. Yeah. So, um, and because they don't satisfy me by and large, if I'm intellectually, okay? Um, and I was thinking, another way of reframing your question, why are they about children, is why are they not about adults? Okay, is it a way of avoiding uh, a whole set of topics mm -hmm. that are fair game when you are talking about adults, but which you would not bring into a film about children. One would be like a, a deeper historical lens, for example. You're not going to have some sort of uh, filmic debate about Japanese colonialism if all your protagonists are nine years old. <laughs> like, it would, it, it, right? They're not, right? Or sexuality beyond banter, right? Or, you know. And so I was. Just thinking about that, saying, and so my question to you is, by avoiding having adults, I understand there are adults as secondary characters that show social problems or what have you, but mm -hmm. in, in, what would you come up with, right, if the, if the question is not why are they about children, but why are they not about adults? What do you take off the table as a, as a conversation? As a result, of, that's my question. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to have to reorient my uh, my thesis and my explanation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I should say that the adults are in the background, so all the kind of social problems uh, are there for um, an adult audience to appreciate. Um, I don't know how these three directors managed to make these films about children that are not annoying. Um, as to why why they choose to make films like this, um, 
I supplement my explanation in, in terms of uh, domestication. It's to do with uh, anxiety, um, anxiety about what's going to happen to the next generation. Are they going to stop being indigenous in, in 50 years? If they lose their culture, if they're not living in traditional communities, they can't speak the language. There's an intense anxiety, a well-founded anxiety today in indigenous communities about their about the next generation. So, so that's I think why the directors are focusing on the, on the next generation. Um, I was just about to say maybe they've given up on the parents or the grandparents. Have they given up? It's in the film uh, Finding Sayun, uh, the widow. Like. The, the film doesn't sp spend any time exploring her life and what she wants out of life and what, what the possibilities are in life for her. It's like, can we given up on her? Oh, then the other fellow on the scene, he's in love with her, so he's going to kind of take care of her, so maybe she'll be able to get married again and have another family. But the film doesn't explore it, so it's almost like it's given up on the parents' generation. But there's still hope for the children. That's, I think, uh, that's what I would add. But what do you think? No, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, something that just occurred to me while you were just talking, getting back to the question of discipline and self, the Foucauldian um, yeah. internalization. Yeah, I really have to keep on talking about Foucault. Uh, I want to be able to use the word discipline and not have it defined. I just have to use some as the Foucault. Foucault. Um, the, the internalization, what would you think about this? Because it's just occurred to me and it's a half-formed thought. But, um, there's essentially a generic in the sense of genre infantilization of indigenous communities that may have been internalized by these directors in general. In other words, that in indigenous communities see by the Taiwanese public, public at large as wards of the state, right? People who cannot make their own decisions, who are essentially children and have to be dealt with accordingly, right? And that these students... If if the movie's about children and the audience says, well, the, oh, these children represent indigenous people. Yes. Yeah, that's... <laughs> right, that, that you can... Dangerous way to represent yourself. Yes, right, something like that, and that these, these directors um, behaving, have, have so internalized this sort of, uh, yeah. you know, the, this panoptic... Sorry, I don't want to slip into, like, you know, that, right? But um, have so internalized the fact that uh, indigenous people must be treated as, you know, we're being watched, it is a film, uh, we're being watched, yeah. we, we, we are treated as sort of stunted adults here, uh, therefore our sort of natural recourse is to not even realize what we're doing is yeah. going towards the representation of ourselves as children, which is essentially just an internalization of, of what the, the dominant... Yeah. Just a thought. My, uh, my response to that would be that if you watch these movies, these kids are, are tough. These kids are not portrayed as helpless and uh, they don't obey orders, they don't tell them what the teacher want, wants them to do. And Lokalaki, the, the, the one about hanging their kids, there are some scenes set, set in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the school, he goes to the elementary school. He hates his teacher. He's always uh, making faces at his teacher. Teacher's kind of mean. He's a tough little kid, what time? So the, it, I mean, it depends how you're representing these children. If you're representing them as, as helpless, that's one thing, but these directors don't, seems to me. So I, that's why I started with agency. Because right. everyone, I think, it's a, it's a rule in academic writing that you, you have to mention agency at some point, so. I wonder if the toughness is, Go ahead. My thought to that was just, and again, these are half big thoughts, but um, uh, whether that, that tough child is just a subset of a noble savage sort of uh, motif, right? Yeah. Um, but just a thought. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Um, I like to, to I like the phrase uh, modern Aborigines. Or modern indigenous people. They're finding different ways of being modern. I think that's what the key, these kids are doing. So if it's noble savage, it's not just the, the same noble savage. You're not just repeating this ad infinitum. It's they're come up, coming up with, with uh, something new. Thank you. Okay, uh, and then Max. Thank you for your
question is, um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the question of um, do you know where these um, movies who subside it, who is the investors, where yeah. the budget come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, also, the Long Mo Dia the Twenty is the same director with Jiri uh, Bawa the Twenty. Is it oh, Jiri Bawa the Twenty, and that's about uh, uh, mainland villages. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, these two. Jensen, Jensen, yeah, yeah, Jensen, 1985. Yeah, yeah. The, I can't find that movie. I've been looking for it for really? a long time. Um, so I'm wondering, is the same director? Because I know who is the uh, Jiri Bawa the Twenty uh, director, but I, I'm not sure. No, what you we can check. Oh. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah, because uh, I'm wondering, uh, maybe the topic also uh, because of the, the who found it, who get yeah, the budget. So if yeah. she takes money from mainland Chinese in investors or from the mainland Chinese government, is she beholden to them? Is um, she going to make oh, the no, funds to so. their messages? Uh, but that's no. a question you could ask. <laughs> yeah, but because uh, maybe they want to justify their, 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 their the, the who subtitled or the yeah yeah the information is available you can either um, you watch the movie in the credits at the end they'll say who funded them and uh, uh, Loka Laki is the Cardinal Shan Foundation mm -hmm. so a Catholic organization that's funded uh, indigenous causes for um, 40 or 50 years and uh, Shun Yi who is funding our book project funded Xun Zhao, uh, Sayun, the first movie that she made, Finding Sayun, um, along with uh, Lin Ke Xiao. Have you heard of Lin Ke Xiao? Lin Ke Xiao was a banker. He was in charge of the fourth large, largest investment bank in Taiwan. He's an economist. He passed away, dived at mountain climbing, um, and he, um, he supported uh, the movie, the first movie that, that she made, because he, he, um, he his favorite song when he was growing up was um, And the, the tune from Yang Yue Guang is uh, from Sayun uh, Zhong, the Sayun no Kami, but they used totally different lyrics, and nobody knew that it was originally the uh, funeral march in Sayun no Kami when, when they're burying Sayun after she sacrificed herself for the emperor. Um, and when he found this out, he, he felt so touched that he went and started visiting entire villages uh, close to where uh, Sayun lived. And the, the subtitle, or maybe it's the title of the film, is uh, Bu Yang Nui Guang. Uh, Bu Yang Nui Guang. Yeah, so, um, so the kinds of people that, were, that are funding these movies are not going to ask the directors to send a certain kind of message or to, to, to change the message in any way. I think the people that are funding these movies are just trying to, to support indigenous directors as they try to express themselves. So I think, uh, from what I can see, nothing has been commercialized. So I have a question to follow up on, uh, on, on Xiaowen. One of the things that struck me was, um, where was uh, public TV? You would have thought yeah. public TV would be the kind of station that would be really promoting these kind of uh, yeah. films, or, or even indigenous TV. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the last one I mentioned about uh, the Pakiran um, is made by uh, by TITV by Indigenous TV, and two of his um, two of his films were made with money from PTS. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. But I talked to Umi Boy, and he said that uh, um, PTS had nothing to do with these films besides the money, besides ah, okay. producing them. Uh, he, exer he exercised total creative control. But the kind of film he, he made, um, PTS is an obvious home for it, or TITV is an obvious home for it. Yeah, so I yeah. one reason for mentioning that is, you mentioned Zhe Wen Tan's uh, trilogy. Yeah, which, the was, was, which was PTS. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a second version of the third uh, film in the trilogy oh. uh, that was remade as a film called um, um, I've forgotten it. It was Wadan the Jopin in the original, Wadan's bottle of yeah. whiskey or whatever. And then it was remade as Mong uh, Huan Bulo, Dream Village. And it was kind of entered into foreign film festivals and made with, uh, is it a uh, 32 million, million, millimeter film? It's one of the last films I know about in Taiwan that was actually made with film and not on video. So I keep on saying indigenous film, they're not films. These 
Contemporary films are all, are all on video now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>